Okay. You're first. Off you go. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely to be with you here today, Howard. So I have got a question about your notion about um, unprecedented collaboration and the fact that it's the only way forward for a sustainable future. Now, a lot of the time, corporate businesses can often lack, um, I guess, uh, have a delay on uh, execution on innovation uh, because of a, lot of, of a lot of red tape. So I was wondering, how can Australian agribusinesses and industry implement this notion of uh, unprecedented collaboration, especially since we've got uh, an, a drought that's devastated communities here? And how can we implement that to have a sustainable and resilient industry? Well, it's not a simple question. Mm. And I don't know that all of you want to hear about my view on why corporations don't innovate as fast as they could. <laughs> but what you do have are corporations who understand that without very significant changes to their practices, the notion of business as usual is not acceptable anymore. So let's, let's put business in one pile. Then you have institutions like CSIRO. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. I was there last year and was so impressed by the quality of the science being done. You have a university like La Trobe here that is specifically given to being working on these sorts of problems. You've got University of Melbourne, you've got Sydney, you've got other schools. How do we frame these questions, is what you're really saying, to get them to act? Everyone needs to do it because it's in their own best interest. So we need to make them understand that the shared best interest is actually much more powerful than the individual interest. And corporations want to be around a long time. I work for a corporation that's over 100 years old. Uh, we're very proud of our footprint here in Australia through Master Foods. And we have faced the same things you're talking about. We, we had to figure out ways to become more efficient in our factories so we didn't waste water. Because we were threatened with shutdown at one point at one of our factories. Collect all the water off the roof. Redu change all your methodologies of engineering to produce the product. Well, we can't do it alone. We have to go to all these institutions. Then we go out, where is our supply chain coming from? It comes from Australia, it comes from India, it comes from here, it comes from there. What is our responsibility to help those people take on new practices? So let's work on water use efficiency. Let's make rice that uses 65% less water. Is it possible? With certainty. So now it's the question of, we have a question we have to build answers. There's no single answer anymore. And then we have to have the business not as usual mentality. And I think you can do it. Awesome. Maya, you have a question? Yes, um, it's actually very wonderful to be here and asking questions of Howard. Um, Howard, you've been involved in a lot of multidisciplinary research and you've done a lot of collaboration among different disciplines. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how would you see the future of the agriculture and the food industry benefit from this? And also, what would you recommend to facilitate the con connection among the disciplines? Another, I could write essays about that topic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't have, I think in the 60s, we were also perfectly optimistic, at least the culture I grew up in. I think Australia was very optimistic too with rock and roll and all the things that were associated with that. We've seen sort of a less optimistic future happen. I know I need, certain, I need things for me to be successful in the work that I do. You know, I really don't know how to make a satellite work to take multispectral imagery of a region to tell me if there's disease. I don't know how to make a backpack soil analytical tool that will do first half of the periodic table in 50 seconds. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. What I do know is who does know. And I know that Brooker can make 
who is a medical device company in Germany, could alter something to give me the ability to do soil samples totally different than ever been done before. No more wet lab, it's all dry. 50 seconds to get a response. Okay, I got soil, and soil's critical. I didn't mention the word soil. If I had another lifetime, I'd only work on soil because it's so critical. Without soil, no matter how much you put onto the ground, it won't grow. So I have to look to people who know how to do this stuff. Uh, the strawberry industry in California, faced with a shrinking labor pool, has developed mechanical pickers that not only pick the strawberries, they put them at the little containers and the whole top of this container, of this big machine, is a cooler. So as they go up and down the rows, they pick the strawberries. And because they can differentiate between perfectly ready to be picked and not ready to be picked, the, the equipment can go back and forth. And the truth of the matter is, none of us in this room want to bend over eight hours a day picking strawberries. It's even hard for me to think of bending that. So <laughs> industry solved the problem, and the people were not displaced. They went on to better jobs. So holistically, a problem, who can solve it? Well, on the satellites, I found a group that could train the satellite to tell me the information I wanted. This is what we have to do. We have to find the pieces. And I'm not embarrassed to say, I don't know how to use a satellite. It, it, it doesn't make me less uh, capable. What I'm happy about is I knew who to go look for because I could call someone one degree of separation. And in a country like Australia, it's all about one degree of separation. How do you find the correct partners who will help you facilitate the solution to a problem? And you don't have to own it. You know, I give away all the genomics I do, maybe to the chagrin of Mars Incorporated, but I think they actually support it. <laughs> because if you own something, the speed of change is only as fast as you are. If you give it away, everybody works on it, so the speed of change is multiplied many times over. So uh, answering uh, sort of obtusely your question, it is this ability to go after multidisciplinary people. There's a great organization called ARPA-E in the United States, and I have spoken at their conference a few times. And basically, if I was an investor, I would invest in everything I saw. People doing stuff that's so magical about understanding with robots, going 16 miles an hour up and down the rows, the nutrition and the maze. You know, it's all in our hands. We simply have to take advantage of it and not be so cloistered or so protective that you think you can solve the problem by yourself. Great answer. Over to Luke now, who has his own honey business in uh, WA. You've got a question relating to bees, I believe. Um, with the world's decline in pollinators, what do you think one of the, what do you recommend to change this practice? I'll, I'll speak as a US citizen where I have more influence on changing rules, but I would encourage someone in this room to pick up my mantra. When you think about large scale, broad acre agriculture, it wouldn't take anything to put a band of three meters around all of your fields that were strictly there for bee population, for pollinators, for honey. It would take nothing uh, to take advantage of the knowledge we have about the habitat for pollinators. One of the greatest things that I ever observed in the UK were hedgerows. You know, pay farmers to plant hedgerows for habitat. Pay them to plant these bands. We already support farmers extensively for different programs. Have a group of universities in Australia put together the best practice for bee pollinators. Because many of you in the room may not be aware, but almost everything you eat is pollinated by a bee, with the exception of a few things. So without habitat for these pollinators, and the removal of the neonic um, pesticides, 
then we're going to face a bigger problem. There are not enough people in the world to go out and shake the, the plants so the wind will pick it up and pollinate it, or to go out and take a one hair brush and pollinate plants that need pollination. So we have to correct the things that are causing the decline and then make it possible to have a better habitat for the things that need that to be able to be pollinators in the future. Can I just add that one third thing that we eat are pollinated by bees? So pretty much everything you eat are pollinated by bees. Yeah, I think it's actually closer to 50%, yeah. depending upon how you look at it. But many things that you love to eat, bee pollination. And they won't be there without these, poll uh, these pollinators. And we face a, a tremendous task in the United States. And uh, you come down the highway certain times of year, we're the world's largest producer of almonds. And they're giant trucks, uh, these big semi-trailers full of beehives that they're moving around the country to pollinate. Makes no sense. The pollinators want to be there. We just, we just have eradicated the habitat for them. And the habitat is useful for many other things. Howard, could I ask you a question? Does Mars Inc. let you off the leash? Like, there'd be a lot of people here thinking, my business won't let me go off and do these maybe civic-minded things or go and partner up with people. Are you on this really long leash and that's why you've been able to achieve so much? Well, I never thought of myself on a leash before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> knock on wood or something oh, material-wise. There you go. That's wood. <laughs> on wood. Um, Mars Incorporated is blessed by being privately held. Though I have friends in public health companies that I could refer to. They don't want to, my, me to call their names out because their bosses might realize what they're doing. <laughs> but uh, John and Jacqueline and the late Forest Mars are so in, we're so enlightened, are still so enlightened. Yeah. You can do your job, Howard? You want to do this? Go out and do it. You want to do the cocoa genome and go to, give it away because it'll give a resilience to a, a crop, a tree crop, that is the heart and soul of Mars Incorporated? Do it as fast as possible. And when I asked John for the money, he gave me more. And when I asked him for the time, he gave me less. <laughs> because if it was as critical as I said it was, then I had to do it faster than I was going to be luxuriant in time. He gave me about two-fifths of the time I asked for. Of course, we delivered. Um, I can't think of any public company that hasn't made promises about these topics. The trick is to find uh, stalwarts in those companies who will make the promises come true. And it's not simple. I mean, you know. Even in Mars, I still have to do my daily job, you know, which is to make sure all the ingredients in all of our products are part of a resilient supply chain. But good ideas will find many, many supporters. Great ideas will find unanimous supporters. Aflatoxin, it's amazing how many people have come up about the aflatoxin puzzle and say, what do you really think is you'll come up with? And I talked to a reporter recently, and I said, 18 months from now at most, we'll have at least 10 ways to detoxify this material. And because it's a public good, we will make it a public good. The African orphan crops, no ownership, not a single gene can be owned in that. The nitrogen fixing maize, it's done under the Nagoya Protocol, the strictest rules, a set of rules that governs how you use a crop from an indigenous group of people. There's a thing called the access to benefit sharing. They receive 50% of all benefit from that financially. And then there's an internationally recognized certificate of compliance, all signed, sealed, and delivered by Mars for the benefit of the community, the Mexican government, and the people thereof. It's pretty amazing. We all need to go back to our bosses and say, can we work like this too? Um, now, I think we've got time for one more question. Who'd like to go? 
So I've worked quite extensively in India with smallholder farmers, enabling them to exit the cycle of poverty through creating sustainable agricultural communities. But it's still alarming to see that food insecurity in India still continues to grow with 195 million people who are malnourished and who are undergoing stunting. So I'm just wondering how your research and work that you've done in Africa can be replicated across developing countries uh, to help them develop the technologies to work towards uh, zero hunger. It's very simple. We'll tell anyone in the world exactly what we did with the African orphan crops, how we organized it. And in fact, I've talked to the Tata Trust before about the Indian Orphan Crops Consortium to improve the rural food crops of India. Uh, but I would look at you and say, I think you should lead that. <laughs> I'd <know>? love to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I've written about Australian orphan crops too because there's, there's the potential that many of these are very useful to the diet and have export markets as well. Part of the African orphan crops is some of the work will be uh, transferred to other places of the world with Africa sending those exports out. Spider plant is much better than spinach. Cocoa yams are better than most sweet potatoes. And the list goes on and on and on. Bambara beans, which are the most nutritious bean in the world and is the main source of protein in East Africa, will be exported in five or 10 years. So the economics just goes like this. So I think it's possible. And I'm happy to share everything. We have reports I can give you. Uh, there is a TED Med presentation on stunting from 2012 that's useful to sort of frame the issues and why you do it. And everything's, everything is public. Everything needs to be public. I mean, very rare is an invention so critical that you need to get IP around it and protect it dearly. So we'll share anything you need with anyone about the African Orphan Crops and the Plant Breeding Academy to get it done. Awesome, I'll take you up on that offer. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, we have run out of time, so please thank our two young pioneers and our teen innovator. <laughs> and Dr. Howard Yana Shapiro for his incredibly inspiring talk and answers. Thank you so much.